and welcome to this special edition of Spotlight. Over the next three nights, we're asking, how should we deal with the trauma that the legacy of 30 years of violence has left us? This past weekend saw a series of extraordinary encounters on BBC Two's Facing the Truth series, presided over by Archbishop Tutu, between a diverse collection of victims and perpetrators. At the moment, it seems the prospects for real progress on truth and reconciliation have run into the ground. The former Secretary of State, Paul Murphy, did visit South Africa to look at how the process worked there, but for now the issue here seems to be going nowhere. The recent failure of the on-the-run legislation demonstrating very well just how difficult it is to find an agreed way forward. Later this week, in a special edition of Let's Talk, we'll examine some of the complex issues surrounding crime and punishment and forgiveness and reconciliation. And we'll ask if any form of government-sponsored inquiry would simply become another way to fight the battles of the past. But first, Kevin McGee has the first of three special spotlight films looking at what happened next for those who took part in facing the truth. Tonight, the story of one soldier's need to confront his past. Behind the walls of this stately home in County Down, a series of groundbreaking encounters have been taking place. And over the weekend, they were broadcast on national television. Archbishop Desmond Tutu oversaw the meetings between killers and those bereaved or injured in the Troubles. In 1971, this army officer, Lieutenant Cliff Burridge, shot and killed this man, Michael McLarnon, in deeply disputed circumstances. Now the former soldier and the dead man's sister get the chance to question each other. I was doing my duty, yeah. actually. Um, but you were angry? I was angry. You were very yeah. angry. I was angry. Right before the end. Yes, I was, uh, yes. Yeah. There's a dramatic moment when the former soldier accepts he shot an innocent man. I'm so, so sorry, you know. Um, so sorry that uh, a, a, a mistake was made and that I made it. And it cost the man his life. That encounter was made possible when both parties accepted an invitation from BBC Northern Ireland to meet here in Ballywalter House. For the soldier, his remarkable journey began a year ago and Spotlight has been with him from the very beginning. This is the story of a soldier's search for forgiveness based on his version of the truth. For him, reconciling the past means revisiting his previous life on the streets of Northern Ireland some 34 years ago. This photograph shows how one IRA suspect looked after an encounter with Cliff Burridge. Covered in blood and barely conscious, this is veteran Belfast Republican Martin Meehan. Tonight, in an unprecedented meeting in the heart of Republican Belfast, the one-time sworn enemies see each other again. I had my finger on the trigger and I was going to shoot you. And it wasn't you. If you'd have been sitting there, quite honestly, I'd have shot you dead. If you'd have done that, then how would you have covered it up? I would have given some excuse. Cliff Burridge left the army in 1973 and now leads a peaceful life in the north of England. He was decorated with the Military Cross for his service in Northern Ireland. Although he only spent a total of nine months on duty in Belfast, what he experienced there has never left him. He's been diagnosed with post-traumatic stress disorder. There's a variety of symptoms, like you get flashbacks during the day, things impress their mind uh, onto your mind and you when it's happened to me I can't see anything else. I can see things going on but all I can take in is this. Then there's nightmares which are obvious. Um, Hypervigilance is something which is you, where you everywhere you go, you walk out and it's just like you're back in the army still. You're watching all the street corners or if you're walking through the woods here your eyes are flitting about like this, just watching everything, you know. Expecting to be shot at. Twice a year he goes to a treatment centre run by the charity Combat Stress. It's for ex-servicemen and women deeply traumatised through active service. 
After years of thinking about it, Cliff Burridge now wants to confront his actions in Northern Ireland head on. Alarm clock, tissues, night gear, socks and pants. With his wife Cathy, he's now going back to Belfast, this time as a civilian. Why now, after all these years, does he want to re-examine his controversial past? It was a battle for reconciliation and a battle for trying to see people healed and um, it's not the same kind of battle, but it's probably a tougher one to fight. You can take arms away from everybody, you can have an efficient police force and everything, but you'll still actually have a potential war in the society because there's all the bitterness and resentment um, and unforgiveness. Flight time to Belfast is just one hour. Making the decision to go has taken years. Morning's going to be upstairs at gate number two. You can be there for around half one. Okay, thanks very much. I've yeah, always said I would like to meet Martin Meehan again. Love to just sit down and have a cup of coffee with him and us talk. And the other loose end, which really is the bigger loose end, is, is meeting the family of that particular guy I shot. And if I can help them in any way, get a deeper understanding of what happened that night or, 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 or something that will help bring some sort of closure. Cliff Burridge joined the army in 1967. He passed through officer training at Sandhurst and hoped the army would quench his thirst for adventure. I read a lot of James Bond books and I wanted to be a bit of a James Bond myself. I wanted to see some action, I wanted some excitement and things and so I thought the army, going through the army was a, a possible route. If it was action the young soldier was looking for, it wouldn't be long before he would find it. The reality of life in 1970s Belfast was far removed from the romance of any thriller. It was very intense and I mean, uh, I, I looked over the wall one day and a bullet just hit, literally hit the wall there and zoomed over my head. If it had been that much higher, I would have got it right between the blinkers. When I finished the tour, I was able by memory to tick off 25 places on the map, put a little cross, where I personally had been shot at. His regiment, the 1st Battalion, the Green Hards, was taking heavy casualties. It was an anxious wait for those at home. I was nursing at the time, living in a nursing home. We were courting, and daily I would go back to the sitting room, switch on the telly, watch the commander being interviewed, and listen to see who's been shot today. Internment without trial was introduced in August 71. In the following two months, five members of the Green Hearts were shot dead and 30 injured, all in and around the small enclave of Ardoin. In the regiment, feelings were running high. All the soldiers were really angry. We want our own back. You know, oh, when we get out on patrol tonight, you know, we'll duff everybody up and stuff. And uh, that was their attitude. Of course, I had to talk and say that's not what we're here for. And I had to be sort of a keep normality. The regiment's colonel was called upon to explain the mounting death toll. It's not all one-sided. We're having our own successes. We have killed gunmen and we have captured gunmen. And we've captured them recently and, and we've shot them recently. Do you feel that one gunman is responsible for these attacks or gangs of independent gunmen or what? Uh, I think that uh, it's possible, I don't, uh, it's difficult to draw absolute conclusion, but I think there is one chap who is uh, doing this in the Ardain particularly. So was there a lone gunman? Could the commander have been referring to the former IRA leader in Ardoin and current Sinn Féin activist Martin Meehan? When I listened to that interview I wondered was he talking about you? No. As far as I'm concerned everybody played their part. That would be naive and extreme to think one person was, was, was doing everything. All as I can say is I played my part. N n no more and no less than anybody else. I have to say that I was proud to be involved 
with the Irish Republican Army. But as far as Cliff Burge was concerned, Martin Meehan was running the IRA in the area, and he finally caught up with them when the army raided a social club. My name was Sam, uh, where's Meehan? Meehan's here, where is he? Martin Meehan looked at me, and I looked at him, and he turned round, he, he squatted down and started putting beers into a can. As I was bound over, I received a merciful uh, knock on the back of the head. Must have been a rifle pot or a kosh. I took out a kosh that I got in my pocket, and I smacked him three times over the head with it, and he just went limp. I grabbed hold of him and pulled it out of the bar like that. And at this stage, it was a rap. Had not she out on the streets, in and around with the, where the league club was. As they tried to get me under the sarsen, I resisted very uh, vigorously. And he ran outside the court. And I ran after him, brought him down. We sort of wrestled on the, the floor, the ground for a minute, and I took a, a knife out of my pocket. You had a knife in your hand? I had a knife in my hand. But what were you going to do with the knife? I was just going to stick Martin Meehan through the throat with it. I was going to stick him with it because I wasn't going to let him go away. That was in November 1971. 34 years later, and Martin Meehan is back inside the club. And Cliff Burridge is outside. Amazing. I mean, the last time I walked around here, we were ready for war. We used to walk around, you know, um, all eyes all over the place, um, in a definite patrol, and yeah, it is amazing. The two are about to meet again, an encounter neither man thought possible until now. <laughs> Hello, Martin. How are you doing, sir? Fine, fine. Long time. Long time. <laughs> I never did speak to you, no? No, I never had any words with you. <laughs> so, have a seat. <laughs> well, uh, 34 years, and a lot of water under the bridge from the end is, yeah, yeah. Hard, hard days. Yeah. And a lot of suffering on both sides. There was, yeah. You know. I can't believe it. Well. And you've got a smile on your face. <laughs> There's no sentiment sad. No, there isn't. You know, no. At the end of the day, this, uh, this is where it all happened that yeah, day. Yeah. And, uh, we're all, uh, we're all doing a job. What, what the happened, Martin, you know, those 34 years ago, if just me, I walked in through the door in my military kit and sat down here. Well, I have to be honest with you, the, uh, the city is in the end days would have been uh, absolutely horrendous because yeah. the, the British Army had inflicted grave, grave injustice and suffering in this area. Yeah. And uh, I don't think anyone at that particular stage would have uh, shown much mercy. No, I'm sure I'm you're right. With you. yeah. uh, That's what I would have expected. Yeah. 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 The conversation quickly turns to the day of the arrest. Well, I thought at that stage the you were going to beat me to death and mm. it wasn't bravery, it was just fighting for life. Right. We, we honestly, we'd come to arrest you, but afterwards, after we had it, or after all that, when 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 we took you down to uh, Flack Street, and then that evening, um, it, it came back to me quite clearly. They wished I killed you, and they would have covered for me, you know, but we didn't do that. Yeah. This must have lasted 15, 20 minutes from the initial attack here, mm -hmm. right under the billiard hall, right through the door, door, right door, right under the alleyway. By the time we'd hustled you through to the entrance, through the billiard hall there, yeah. you know, where the snooker tables were, whatever they were, you, all your shirt was off then and you were all slippy with blood. That's right. Because I'd hit you over the head and it had bled and you all just... What did you have done? A little steel bar like that, which had a lead core to it, and I thought it'd knock you out, but it didn't really, did it? No, it didn't. <laughs> it, didn't uh, it didn't because you were young and you were vibrant, and you, yeah. you yeah. knew that you were going to be killed. I thought I was going to be killed, right. so I might as well go down fighting. Yeah. I pulled out a knife, and I was going to stick you in the throat with it, and you just suddenly went, and I went. Oh, oh, well, that's it then, you passed out. 
this but, one, this but I one. didn't pass it. I was only pretending to save myself. <laughs> was he really? Yeah, I wasn't unconscious. Well, but I never. Well, you did. You did save yourself because I had the knife and I was just going to go like that. I was part for the course. I was involved. Yeah. I could understand that. Yeah. And uh, I'm not complaining in the sense, you know, because you were involved in a conflict and uh, yeah. you suffer the consequences yeah. at the end of the day. We've seen the British soldiers as the invaders. Uh, foreign troops coming into our country. I know you did. I know you did. <laughs> That's the way we yeah. see it. And, 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 and I, I, I said, even when, as a young man in the army then, I said to my platoon, I said, quite honestly, um, if I'd been born in the Ardoyne and brought up in the Ardoyne and everything, yeah. I'd have been in the IRA. You know? Yeah. Well, yeah. I might have been your right hand man. That's that, that's ironic, I think. Yeah, but I'm tr I'm really truthful about that. I really mean that. Yeah, you know. The philosophy and the objective of the IRA the days was to uh, drive the British Army to the sea. Mm -hmm. Probably looking back in retrospect, it was a, a naivety at its extreme. Yeah. With the uh, the manpower and the equipment and the expertise and the intelligence that you said, but they did believe that there, mm. and uh, basically, uh, if you had been killed, or so many soldiers had been killed, uh, would that have changed the situation? But at that particular, people were living day by day, yeah. and reacted to things that was happening the day before. Uh, there was no long planning for next week or next month yeah. or next year. The issues, as far as I was concerned, as a young commissioned officer, were not clear cut yeah. at all. And I remember one of my officers, a fellow officer, saying to me, an Irishman is nothing more to me than a figure 11 target. You know, yeah. just to be shot on the range sort of thing, you know. And yeah. I had all sorts of emotions going on in, my, in myself, you know. Um, my platoon, we, we seemed to bear the brunt of what was going on almost. Um, every time we went out we got ambushed sort of thing, you know. Um, and so there was all these emotions going on, but uh, it wasn't as clear cut as, as what you were doing. I mean, you knew what you were doing. But could I ask you one question? Yeah, was that, uh, when the soldiers were out on patrol, mm -hmm. uh, were they given a free hand to do whatever they want, or was there a strict code of conduct where, you know, was orders coming down from a high, you know, you know, do we just want to do as need be? No, or? that didn't happen. But I didn't realise until right at the end of our tour, some of the other guys would, would rough people up and just butt stroke people on the street. Yeah. Is that what you're talking about? Well, I think even more serious than that. Right. You know, you had a situation where a whole stretch of innocent people were yeah. shot for, for no reason other than they were just uh, Catholics at their own. And it seemed to be revenge. It seemed to be because they couldn't uh, get the, the volunteers who was involved in the conflict with them at that particular yeah. time. Uh, yabba, yabba dabba do, anybody will do. And that's, that was the impression. Right. The well, perception that the people of this area had. That Martin Meehan was a leading IRA man is not in any doubt. He spent almost 20 years in prison, serving two lengthy sentences for kidnapping. But of course not everyone in Ardoin joined the IRA. Far from it. There were plenty of families just trying to get on with their lives, like the McLarnans who lived here in Etna Drive. They had a family tradition of joining the British Army, and Michael was the third son to go into the forces. But he brought himself out of the parachute regiment and returned home. The streets where he grew up would soon resemble a battlefield. <laughs> Lieutenant Burridge would be at the fore. I think I shot four people, and I think I killed three of them. They said to me when I left that up to that time, I had shot more people than any other officer. But he says he can't remember all their names. When I left Northern Ireland, I can remember it all clearly, but for some reason, a few months later, or maybe a year later, I don't know, my mind just blanked out. The one killing he does clearly remember 
happened not long after he had been injured in a riot. I'd been hit on the head with a bottle. I went out that night and it was a peculiar feeling. I thought, tonight I'm going to kill a gunman. I just knew I was going to get somebody that night. There was a, a real sort of sense of wanting revenge, a real sense of, yeah, really wanting revenge for being hit on the head with a bottle. I had other soldiers hurt and things, but actually nothing had touched me. Uh, nearly, many times, but, but not actually. And so I went out that night. I had a real vengeful spirit. While on patrol that evening, Cliff Burridge ordered his men to take over a house in Etna Drive, close to the McLaren home. I went into the house, and the young lady turned and looked at us and said, Don't you say a word! And she wasn't going to say anything. She was so frightened she couldn't even speak. She just, like this absolute fear. For the first time, the couple living in the house speak publicly about what happened that night. I was very upset. I was in a very emotional state because they kept threatening to shoot us and they kept taking the magazine out of the gun and putting it back in and putting it to my head and telling him to sit down. I was rather agitated. I was, I suppose, mouthing off a bit at them for taking over the house and whatnot. And, uh, we just had us in a situation where we could do nothing other than comply with our request. And that was it. Just sit there and be quiet. And then they went about their business. I went upstairs with um, one of my soldiers and I said, let me have that rifle. And the rifle had a, a night scope on it, a C in the dark scope, as they call it now, a, they used to call it starlight scope then. And I opened the window and looked through, and it was dark. You could see, you could see figures just about, but, it was, but that was all. But through the scope, it was clear as daylight, except it was green. Everything was green. And there was a man standing in the, in the road with a, with, with a, a handgun, an automatic, semi-automatic, and then just by him were a couple of guys with rifles. The guy that was standing there with the automatic, semi-auto, was certainly in control. And he was directing people. He was directing things like this. And I, I, he was sort of agitated and walking about a bit. And I followed him with my rifle. And then for some reason he looked up, right at me. He got, there's no way he could have seen me, but he looked up at me like that and bang, I shot him. Michael McLaren was hit by a single bullet to the chest. He died later in hospital. Did you give him a warning? No. Why not? A warning wasn't due. In theory, I should have said, drop the gun. But there had been shooting in the area just minutes before. And with that So there shooting, was no warning you were going to No, warning. no, but because there had been shooting in the area, I did not have to give a warning. Everybody knew there was shooting in the area. Locals maintain the only gunfire was coming from the army. As well as Michael McLaren, another person was hit. There was somebody behind him, a woman who I believe was called Margaret McGrandles, standing behind him and she fell over. I can see, I can now see her coat coming up like this as she fell over. And the bullet had gone through her. That upstairs bedroom window. This is Margaret McGrandles, 34 years later. She still has shrapnel from Cliff Burge's bullet embedded in her spine. I went in the Mahan, because I had Mahan in my pocket, and, and through my head. And I had to get the Han sort of that's on again. My hand is lying open, hanging off there. And the said the pelvis was broken, couldn't walk, and six weeks in hospital. I'd sort of learned to walk again. They said that I was uh, organizing gun men, the knew that I was shot, which was proved I wasn't when I gave my interview. And they gave me 5,000 pound compensation, so I wasn't you know, and anything. We weren't that type of family. The army insisted Michael McLaren was an IRA gunman. When he was shot, 
he was in possession of a gun and was organizing other gunmen to set an ambush security forces in an area where security forces had just come under gunfire some few moments beforehand. We shot this man deliberately and to kill him. He was undoubtedly an IRA gunman. No weapon was ever found. The dead man's family protested his innocence. They said Michael had stepped out onto the street just a few moments before he was shot. Well, my son was out fixing his motorbike in the back, and it is early on that gun, I'm out fixing the motorbike. And as he come in, he has two eyes, a sedan ticket, and as that, the bin lids went in the street, and he come out. He was only two seconds out when he come stolen and fell on the floor. He says, no, I'm shot. And the delivery more than my son was to, who? It's all he did. Cliff Burridge insists he had the right to shoot Michael McLaren, but paradoxically, he has always felt guilty about it. It was totally legal what I did. There's no doubt about it. But really, in my heart, I murdered the guy. And I think that's what got me. I knew I had done something bad. And I, I felt I'd crossed over a barrier, perhaps, a, a moral barrier. I knew I could never go back. It had been done. I could never get that life back. And uh, it agitated me and played on my mind, definitely. The woman standing beside Bridget McLaren is Mary, the dead man's sister. Even today, the pain is still there, and she wants her brother's name cleared. There was nothing to suggest Michael McLaren was in the IRA. No IRA funeral, and no IRA death notices in the press. My mother and father are dead, Michael's dead, and it'll never bring any in back. But I think you need, you need to do something in your life. And if it's for justice for Michael's character, can't bring him back, but justice for Michael's character. I want justice for my brother Michael. My brother Michael deserved justice. He was blamed in the wrong and he lost his life. It was this desire to get to the truth that convinced the dead man's sister she should meet the soldier. And the desire for reconciliation motivated Cliff Burge. I've got a few butterflies, but I'm very relaxed about the day otherwise. If there can be forgiveness at the end of the day, it would really be wonderful. And of course, um, I'm quite prepared to be wrong and humble myself um, if I need to. Feeling okay? Yeah. You sure you want to go ahead with us? Oh. Yes. Okay. Thank you for coming here today for this is a very courageous and very important step to be sitting at the same table. It is a forum, a safe space in which you hope we, we can facilitate your story being told. The former officer introduces the idea that the sight on the gun he fired may not have been working properly. And as the morning goes on, he accepts for the first time that he had indeed killed an innocent man. As far as I was concerned, I'd shot a gunman. Yes. There was no doubt about it. He was right there. There's a possibility um, that I could have shot, actually, I was aiming at the gunman, but there's a possibility I could have shot somebody next to him. But you were angry? I was angry. You were very angry. I was angry. You were angry. for revenge? Yes, I was, uh, yes. Yeah. yeah. That's just what I wanted to do. But I, I, uh, and but what I, I have told the truth. Yes. There, there was the gunman there. Yes. And I, I am, I'm certain now that the man I shot at was a gunman, but that I hit Michael. Yes. And he was, he was just there. But he wasn't, he, he wasn't the man I, he wasn't the man he I... He wasn't the man I aimed at. I aimed at, no, definitely no. not. No. So he was shot by mistake. Yes, yes. I just want to say I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. Will you forgive me? Can you? I haven't got the power to forgive anybody because I ask God to forgive me mm -hmm. and my everyday life. Yes. So I don't really have the power to forgive everybody. Because I'm like, yeah, I have to ask God 
to forgive me. Not long after shooting Michael McFarlane, Cliff Burge had a religious experience. In 1975, he wrote to the dead man's family. Dear Mr. and Mrs. McLarnan, I am sorry from the bottom of my heart. I confess to you now that although on duty I killed your son, deep in my heart was a lust for revenge. I was shocked at what I was really like. Please forgive me if you can, I beg of you. Clifford. After the meeting chaired by Desmond Tutu, Mary McLarnan felt her brother's name had been cleared. But she felt the soldier was holding back. She wanted more answers. The pair agreed to meet again. To summarise really mm. what happened last time, you said that uh, you had aimed at a gunman, but the person that you shot wasn't that gunman. Well, it yeah. was Michael McLaren. Yes, after hearing Mary's evidence, what Mary had said, I mean, it, it, was, it was quite something for me because uh, for 30 odd years, I just thought I shot the gunman. But oh, from Mary's, Cliff, yes, from Mary's, from Mary's evidence. No, Cliff, you didn't. Mm -hmm. Thank you, you always shot a gun man for the last 30 years. You wrote my mother a letter and asked her for forgiveness. Yes. So, basically, for 30 years you knew you didn't shoot a gun man? No, I wrote that letter because I knew I'd done legally what I'd done, and it was, it was correct, but... I also knew that there was people that hurt very much, and I thought to myself, I need to make, I need to be honest with them, and so that's why I wrote the letter and said, you know, I had that hatred in my heart, that revenge in my heart. If you thought and were convinced that you'd shot a gunman and done the right thing, why did you want forgiveness? I wanted, I asked for forgiveness because I realized that the parents were there, that's all I knew. And if they could forgive me, there would be some measure of healing. And I, I, I need, to, and I knew also I needed to put my. I shot their son. I mean, if he'd be, if if he'd been standing there with grenades around his neck and a Thompson machine gun, and actually in the in, in the process of firing, I'd still shot somebody's son. How many people did you kill? In your line of duty, as you would call it as a soldier? As far as I know, I think it was three, as far as I know. And did they not have that impact on your life? No, heart? never. And did you not think to yourself that was why you knew you shot an elephant man? No, no, I didn't. I sh I sh the man I shot at was standing there, clearly, with a handgun in his fist, and he was he appeared to be organising things. That's the impression I got from what you described as your brother. Your brother wasn't the man I fired at. I can only say that he was just in the wrong place uh, at the wrong time, really, yeah, as he came out, you know, and said, what's going on? Um, that's when I fired at the, gu the gunman and must have hit him. Um, that's all I can say. Uh, I'm so, 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 so sorry. And, and that's how I feel now. I'm so sorry. And it's not, but there's nothing else I can feel, nothing else I can say. And I've gone quite a long way to exposing myself with the letter, and so I feel I've taken that step. Honestly, I didn't realise that I had shot the wrong person. But I do believe that now. I, uh, you do. Your Michael is not the man that I fired at. Mary, is there anything you'd like to say? Well, I think he's genuinely sorry for what happened. Mm. And I hope that you've told the whole truth. I uh have, -huh. yes, really. And then there's nothing more I can mm. ask you. No. I'm just sorry. I really am sorry. Can I just... I really am sorry. How you doing? I'm all right, Martin. I'm back down. Happy New Year. After Martin Meehan was arrested by the Green Hards, his time in Crumlin Road Prison was much shorter than anyone expected. Two weeks later, he escaped. When I was arrested, uh, we escaped two weeks later after that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. For, what was your reaction to that? Well, we went by then back in Germany. Everybody was pig sick. 
And I thought to myself, well, I'm going back over to Northern Ireland because I had to come over for some court cases and things. I thought, if I see Martin Meehan anywhere, if I come up with some traffic lights and there he is in the car next to me, I said, I thought I'm just going to shoot him straight to the head. That was my attitude. Return he did and was again tasked to arrest Martin Meehan after he'd supposedly been spotted in a city centre bar. I knew that I was just going to come and shoot you. And then, no, I wasn't going to do anything else. I was just going to come and kill you. You were sitting there at the bar on a high bar stool with your back to me. And I looked round to see if there was any of your henchmen with you, and it didn't appear that there was. I walked past you to the door, whizzed round, took my Smith & Wesson out. I was a bit further away than this, and I was I had my finger on the trigger, and I was going to shoot you. You looked at me, and you went like that, and it wasn't you. If you'd have been sitting there, quite honestly, I'd have shot you dead. The view that I'm there, how would you have covered it up? Oh, I, I would given have... Given some excuse? Yeah, I would have given some excuse, saying uh, your hand went like this, and you know, have your gun. It. it would have been, yes, it would have been. In spite of this, there now appear to be no hard feelings between the former lieutenant and the one-time IRA leader. I have to say, uh, I'm absolutely delighted the fact that I have met you. Mm -hmm. uh, you've been very honest. Mm -hmm. You've been forthright. And I really, really think that uh, unless you talk till your enemy, I think that's the way forward. I'm just so pleased that we can do this. And we shook hands when we met, and I know we're going to shake hands when we leave, and it's, it's just really good. It's done me a power of good. I hope it's done you good, and, and, but as an as a overall perspective, this is what needs to happen um, throughout Northern Ireland. Hey, thank you very, very much for coming here today. It hasn't been easy for you. Uh, it hasn't been easy for you to come into this club and uh, take courage. And uh, I think you have to be congratulated for that. Well, a thing I'd like to say, and I, I don't know if I can, there's some way I would like to apologize as, as a Brit here and as, as an ex-army officer for some of the things that we did, um, which should never have happened. And I can only say I'm sorry. It's inadequate, totally inadequate. I can only say I'm sorry about that. <laughs> well, before you go, Cliff, uh, I'd like to give you a small gift. This is a token of my appreciation of you coming here today uh, with best wishes for the future. Uh, this has been with me a long, long time. It was made in Long Cash Concentration Camp. And it's a Long Cash belt with, as you see yourself here, the names on it. Yes. And uh, the hits blocks. Oh, wow. Uh, and there you are. It'll probably be a bit big for you. Yeah, the middle, I, I might need another hole in <laughs> So I, I'd like to give you as a token of appreciation. Martin, thank you very much. So and I wear about always. And yeah. I can tell you this is going to be the one I wear now, yeah. if that's okay by you. Yeah, that's yours. It was mere inside prison, mm. and uh, that'll be yours. Thank you, yeah. Martin. Thank you very much. Best wishes. It's often said, in conflict, truth is the first casualty. Unraveling the past and agreeing on it is far from straightforward. Who has the right to apologize, or forgive, and on whose behalf? With the passage of time, how close can you get to the real truth? Do you believe, Claire? Absolutely. One hundred percently. The letter I received that he wrote, the, the days that that happened, the day when his, he was hit with a milk bottle with the seven stitches in his forehead, every letter, every incident has never altered. He was a hardened soldier going out there doing his job and yes things around about might sometimes have been you know the truth might have been swayed but I know my husband it's not in him to go through 35 years of telling lies my life wasn't ruined by the past I just carried on with life but 
there were two things that were outstanding that I, I just felt I needed to clear up, really. It was one meeting Martin Meehan, and the other was meeting, as far as I was concerned, then the parents of Michael McLaren. But they're dead, but I've met his sister. And been able to talk to her about it, I feel that that loose end has just been tied up, and I feel very relaxed about it, very pleased. I can't say a massive burden has gone off my shoulder, but it has because it hasn't. But I feel very privileged to have been able to do that, meet her face to face, and I'll shake hands, and yeah, tremendous. Well, it was most fun for me to meet the soldiers, to get the truth, and to get the bottom of the truth. And for him to admit that he made the mistake, that he killed my brother and he took his character. And we had to live with that for 34 years. And that's why I wanted to meet him. And I think that's what has to be done. But we want to move forward and get things done in this life. You have to go about it and get it done. And to get justice for my brother, he's still dead, it'll never bring him back. But his name's cleared. He's made, the soldier said, he made a mistake. Michael McLaren is only one of more than three and a half thousand victims of Northern Ireland's troubles. And as his death shows, each tragedy has touched many, often in very different ways. Behind many of the deaths, there is still a desire for the truth. But the truth, it seems, like peace, comes dropping slow. On tomorrow night's Spotlight, one of the IRA's longest serving prisoners comes face to face with the English policeman he shot and left for dead. If you've been affected by any of the issues in tonight's programme and would like to talk to someone in confidence for further information and support, Please call the BBC Action Line on 08000 565 450. That's 08000 565 450. Lines may be busy, so please remember the Action Line is open seven days a week from 7.30 in the morning until midnight, and all calls are free 